I'm Jim Tech. You're watching Kelowna Now in our ongoing coverage of this BC election. We're talking to all the candidates in 30 minutes or less. And with me today, Dr. Humer uh, for Kelowna Centre. Thanks for inviting me. Yeah. So uh, um, you were running for the BC United Party and then Kevin Falcon made that choice. And now you're running it as independent. Um, what, what makes you still want to run, I guess, you know, like, because if the party kind of like... That's a great question. Yeah. So back on health care, obviously health care brought me into this election. Yeah. And I have a long experience in health care, so it brought me into the election. And you're asking me what kept me in this election? Why do I want to keep running? Because of democracy, really. You know, I think we all thought at the end of August when Kevin did his thing that the center-right coalition was going to form and that that was going to be the path to defeat the NDP. Well, it didn't happen. And because it didn't happen, democracy, I believe, was starting to be controlled by something on the right and something on the left and taking a lot of people's vote away. And in fact, I personally was, th was not knowing where I was going to vote. So democracy brought me back or kept me into this. So you're a doctor. You've been in the KGH for how long were you in KGH? Uh, 21 years. 21 years. And you're a thoracic surgeon? Yeah. So I was 28 years a thoracic surgeon. That's non-cardiac disease of the chest. So lung cancer, esophageal cancer. Worked yeah. in Prince George, Kamloops, and for the last 21 years in Kelowna. Healthcare is one of the major concerns for British Columbians. Lack of access to healthcare. Um, and one of the questions that we've, we've reached out to the minister, Adrian Dix, several times to do a live stream. I've spoken to the premier. I've spoken to their jobs minister. I've spoken to the force minister. He won't speak to us. Um, is, it, is it not unhealthy to have, unhealthy to have a, a health minister that won't be held accountable by the press? It certainly is not the best way. I mean, you know, you mentioned accountability. Absolutely. Transparency. And access. And so we can delve more into it, but certainly healthcare is a real reason why I'm here. Yeah, healthcare is, is, is especially in the interior, and we look to the north, these emergency room closures. I mean, I think there's one hospital in the south of us here, 30 closures in the past two years. They're devastating. Yeah. And How it, can you close an emergency department? And you know where they were closing them in Oliver, in Merritt, in Lillooet, even in Williams Lake. Yeah. Right? So in some places there are some. Some of those, they're saying you can drive 400 kilometers for a care. Absolutely. And, you know, one of the reasons why I exist here in the interior, I trained as a thoracic surgeon in Vancouver, but I wanted to provide services for all British Columbians, so I originally moved to the north and the interior so that health care would be equitable across the province. Yeah. And that's what these, um, these closures of the emergency department certainly aren't equitable. They don't seem, yeah, they don't seem to be equitable. They're not fair. No. And... And it seems, and I don't want to get too far down this road, but it seems like, like the, the mayor and merit was quite outspoken. Mm -hmm. He lost two doctors due to the vaccine mandate. Um, and they took a long time to relieve that when most of North America relieved that mandate. And, and BC was the last holdout. And it really frustrated the doctor and merit. And so... I'm oh, sorry, not yeah. the doctor, the mayor. Sorry. Yeah, and, and what I would say is I don't think we should be making these decisions based on ideology. And I'm a person of science, and we need to make the best decisions we can. And we were the last area in North America to get rid of the mandates, and it did seem vindictive that we waited so long to get rid of the mandates. It seemed like the punishment was punitive because, you know, like we've, we see all the time, we do stories all the time, you know, a nurse, you know, takes, like, uh, takes some drugs or, you know, like uh, out, of the, out of the dispensary or, or hits a patient or something, and then they get two weeks, they get, you know, three weeks suspension and stuff like that. And it seemed like for a long time that the people that refused the vaccine were given almost like a life sentence like their career was over. I think I would say, if you said, again, one of the reasons why I'm running, Jim, is to try to make sure the voice of the provider and the patient is there. And again, it shouldn't be all top down. It shouldn't be from Victoria or Vancouver to determining what happens. Yeah, and it seems like whether even if we're talking about healthcare or forestry, because the forest sector has also been devastated, mm -hmm. and, it, and it's the rural communities the, outside the lower mainland. It's the Prince George's, the Houston's, the Bear Lake, and all those areas. Um, and even when I interviewed the premier, they recognized that forestry is kind of a shambles. And how do we let our second largest industry kind of become a shambles? Is it because most of the focus seems to be on the lower mainland and the rest of BC can, is, is taking a back seat? I'm not even sure it's intentional, Jim, as much as the fact is that when you're the big organization in Vancouver, 
they want all of these things to be determined from Vancouver. As you know, we're so sensitive in this region about forestry and wildfires. And to me, the experts are the people that have been in the industry forever, that have fought the wildfires. And again, it comes back to why I'm here, because I think the voice needs to come up from the bottom and not always from the top down. So if you were elected and you got to form government and somehow you ended up there as a minister, as minister of health, kind of like the fit for you? Well, it's certainly where I start, yeah. yeah it's, I'm I passionate that. about it. And, and I, I think that, where do you see like our health care across the province? Like if you had to rate it on a scale to one to ten, where do you think we're at? So it's hard to give you a number now. And, you know, I started my career, I started medical school 41 years ago. So I'm obviously involved in the healthcare system. I've been politically aware. I've seen what's happened. We had the best healthcare system in Canada, and it was something we were proud of. And certainly it's deteriorated. And on most metrics, we're way down near the bottom. And the challenge is, Jim, we spent a lot of money in healthcare. So if you look at our GDP compared to other nations, we spent a lot of money in healthcare. I believe we're not putting in the right thing. Too much bureaucracy, too much red tape. It's fixable, but it's going to require a commitment. Yeah, I've, I've heard that from other people saying that we're really top-heavy administratively and, and not so much on the, on the doers, right, on, on the people on the, on the ground, right? The, the ones at the bedside. Yeah. The ones that are touching patients, whether those are nurses, pharmacists, lab techs, all of those people, that they're the part of the system. They provide access to the system. Yes, you need some bureaucracy, but we're way too heavily laden with that. It seems like you'd be a great advocate for healthcare because you've been in the system. I mean, usually, it's the best people to understand a problem are the ones that are kind of in the system, right? And, you know, I was a thoracic surgeon, so I looked after lung and esophageal cancer forever. And people say that must have been a little bit discouraging. It wasn't at all. It was a critical time of people's lives. And guess what? At that point, they knew what they wanted. You know, life becomes quite clear when you have that. And they wanted access to service. They wanted to deliver it compassionately in a timely manner. They wanted to be part of their solution, and they wanted to be collaborative. And so they, so they know what they want. And I get called almost every day from people around the province who need help navigating the system. And it's just so hard to get into the system and to navigate through the system. So running as an independent is obviously hard, right? Like it's definitely, you don't have that, you know, like the party behind you and stuff like that. It's definitely even more challenging, I would say. Yeah. Um, you do have a, a name recognition and you do have uh, credentials to kind of yeah. like go with what you're doing. How, what are you finding when you're at the door when, people, when you talk to people? So it's certainly a challenge. It isn't the typical independent because I think a lot of times typical independent in the past has been a person that has had a certain ideology that they wanted to represent. We were actually well-vetted, well-functioning candidates in the center legacy party. Right. Right. So it absolutely is a challenge. But, you know, the cool opportunity where both sides now, the candidates will have to toe the party line and they'll have to preach the ideology the party says. The people that I'll have to answer to are the citizens of Kelowna Center. So, in fact, it gives the voice in this specific election, I believe, to the constituents. Yeah, I did an interview with Mario Canseco, one of the you know, leading pollsters mm-hmm. here in BC, and he said that this is an unusual circumstance that we have highly qualified independent candidates that have been vetted running in a race. Um, so it really adds a lot of um, complexity to this election, right? Because usually, like you just said, yeah. independents tend to be, you know, they, they don't get very many votes and it's, you know, like mm-hmm. something and they're just maybe trying to make some noise. But this time we actually have, you know, vetted high quality candidates that are more to the center than, than, than anybody. And John Rustad has moved to the center a bit, but I'm, according, not, I'm not sure. Yeah. Well, it looked like he was doing with Leonard Sturko and a couple other things, but then all of a sudden when this amalgamation happened, they, people thought, Oh, well, that's even going to be more to the center. And then all of a sudden, you know, they kind of like the silence was, I think, deafening, right? It, the silence was deafening. I mean, I think all of us took a sigh, a breath out and said, when Kevin did his thing, we said it might have been ham-handed, but we were probably going to be okay because yeah. the center-right coalition was going to form. Yeah. But all of our phones never rang, and John Rustad made the decision that he didn't really want to get a coalition-type party, and I don't believe it's a winnable op- option. Yeah, I think I, I, I've heard from a lot of people saying that they're quite disappointed that, that the opportunity that was presented wasn't taken advantage of. And I think David Eby is probably like quite um, pleased with that. Maybe, 
Um, I think to some degree that EB and Rustad both wanted to take away choice in the middle. And for a time they thought, well, they'll have to choose between us or them. And they wanted to take away that choice. And what the candidate, what the 13 plus independent candidates have done have said, hey, you actually have a choice. You have a well vetted candidate who's run a good campaign. And the other thing is, is if we can stop either of EB or Rustad from getting a majority, then the independents can, on behalf of their constituents, can hold these power, two guys. Yeah. yeah, and we won't have four years of kind of an Andrew majority. Weaver situation where you well, kind of like. Well, Andrew Weaver was a couple. Yeah. A couple of people, but if mm-hmm. we can get a significant number, yeah. and we, I, I'm never allying with the NDP. Like uh, and Andrew Reaver is now switched, but um, mm-hmm. um, but it w- it will give voice. So it's interesting as well. With one of the main things, like the party platforms for the NDP, was carbon tax, and you know Pierre Polyev had been at David Eby on the carbon tax for a while, and he said he'd never budge off of it. And all of a sudden, the election comes around. All of a sudden, you know, they're, they're ready to kind of move away from the carbon tax and, and all those things. And now they're giving away money with housing and all that kind of stuff. So, so carbon tax is gone. All of a sudden, involuntary care is on there. So yeah. it, it must be that EB and the NDP feel what I was hearing at the doors. So people at the doors were unhappy with the NDP and they said, we want a new government. Yeah. Um, so all of a sudden, EB's policies have come towards the center. I'm not even sure what he represents. Yeah. The concern I have is that all of these things are coming back in spades if he gets a majority. Yeah, so seven years at the wheel. If you have the wheel for seven years, do you take responsibility for your actions or do you try to blame somebody else? I, if, you're, if you're a surgeon, yeah. there's no one else to blame. Yeah. You, are, you take responsibility for actions. And I'm, I will always be a surgeon. Why did I go into politics? Because I care so much about health care in BC, I want to try to help fix it. Other issues are the similar issues at the doors were affordability, cost of living, and public safety. I was shocked, really, how much public safety was an issue, not just even downtown, but into the suburbs, into the Dilworth, into the wilderness yeah. areas. Yeah. And I would say that the biggest, as a media, like media is being decimated, a lot of to do with federal issues. We've seen another radio station close, a uh, news station close in Kamloops, I think, this week, NL yep. Radio. And we're seeing, you know, like, chorus, and, you know, like, it's, 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 it's really rough out there for media. But it's really rough when government won't be held accountable as well. And I think that's one of the frustrations for some media. Will independence be held accountable? Will you talk to the media well, even after you're elected? Absolutely. And the great thing is, guess who will be able to keep either party accountable? Yeah. It'll be the independent because they will act specifically not under party, right? They'll not be controlled by the party. So absolutely, we will. How do, how do we How do we? get these like especially minister because you have more power as a minister and you can like we saw that with with covid you know like adrian dix and bonnie mm-hmm. henry basically ran the province for uh, mm-hmm. a couple of years right and then very little would they take questions from anybody or be held accountable how do we fix accountability we keep remembering what it's about and in medicine it was always about the patient and in politics, it's all about that individual voter and the constituents. And we don't want a system where we serve the system. We want the system to serve people. My whole career has been about serving the patients, and we would continue to serve and act for the patients. It's a good quote people. from Ronald Reagan, right? And government should be fair to, scared of the people, not people scared of the government. Yeah, absolutely. And and you know, and this is the people's time to exercise their vote and, and look at who will be held accountable and who will answer to... When, when the press asks a question, the press is not asking a question. I don't ask the question for myself. You know, it's not for me, right? The question is for the public, right? Absolutely. So, you know, I, I'm, the, I'm the conduit, right? I'm yep. just, I'm the surrogate that's asking the question that, that I hear out there. People come to me and say, hey, what's going on here? What's going on here? Mm-hmm. My job is to ask you the question, and yep. your job is to answer to the public, right? Sure. You know, great. The best way to answer the public is going out and door knocking. Yeah, I sure. mean, it, it you was, hear from them, right? You hear from them on yeah. their door, on their terms. You hear what they want to say. What do you think the issues are right now? It's like the the big issue that comes when you when you knock on that door. What's the, the the most common thing that people say to you? So there's three issues. There's the affordability, cost of living. I mean, and it is devastating, as yeah. you know. Yeah. There's a whole generation behind us where home ownership is going to be incredibly complex. And that's so disheartening, and it's so demoralizing. So I hear that from people. I hear from a number of kids and being in their 20s. I'm working hard at school. I still don't see home, home ownership. And then, as I mentioned, public safety. I was surprised how much public safety is really an issue. I thought when um, Kevin Falcon 
came out about involuntary care. I thought that there might be trouble with that. People are, are saying we want compassionately delivered involuntary care because we're seeing these people dying on our streets and it's, it's not right. But ultimately for me, they talk about health care. And, you know, it's interesting when you think about what health care can do for you. If we do more prevention, then the situations that require interventions and in complex addictions, complex mental health, we can prevent so many of them. So really, I believe that health care is so important in terms of the viability of this problem. It's a problems. large cost for us, for sure. And it's and a lot of it can be prevented just by, by education, for sure, right? I mean, my, yeah. daughter, my daughter's a nurse as well. And I... I we spent very little time, even during the COVID years, of talking about how we can be in better shape and encouraging people to do things. Right? Absolutely. If you said, what is the holy grail? It's universal access to primary care. And what does that mean? When you come to town, you have universal access to public education, meaning that your child, you don't have to knock on the door and say, is the school accepting you? If we had a healthcare system that you were just accepted no matter what, we would do way more on prevention and early on, again, mental health, addictions, and the like. So we need to strive for that. That has to just be something as a society that we do. And the savings would be tremendous. You've been, you've been in, the, in the system for quite a while, and we're doing something on AI. What do you see how AI can help the medical system, and, and should we be embracing it? Absolutely. It's interesting. One can get frightened about AI. But if you look at what AI could do in healthcare, it helps the diagnosis. And there are more diagnoses and more illnesses. It'll still be guided and led by the physician. But AI is so vital in the future of healthcare, making it more efficient and more accurate and more precise. And it's been scientifically studied that it helps with the diagnosis. And it'll be distribution of information, too, though, as, as things are discovered, uh, things can be shared, uh, and from uh, surgeons around the world, if uh, they said, hey, absolutely. we just did this, and this worked. And um, so, and I'm in the information business, and we love to get the information disseminated as quickly as possible amongst surgeons, as you say, amongst patients. So AI is fantastic. Yeah, no, I, I think it, it'll be a great thing for for people. I, I, the, the biggest frustration I hear from people when, they, when we hire somebody new is that they can't get access to a family doctor, right? And it's it's so tough, right? Like you usually have to find a network or a friend that some a doctor will accept somebody. And you think about that. I mean, we're looking at this beautiful city of Kelowna here. We're trying to attract the best and the brightest. They One of the big decisions you come when you come to town with your family is can I get health care? So it has to just be understood that, yes, we'll have universal access to primary care and you'll get health care. Because Kelowna is also a center for the region, though, too, right? KGH is, is one of the, the larger and more important hospitals in region. our whole We're area. looking at it right here, 21 operating rooms at KGH. It's probably the second largest operating room facility in the province, bigger than Surrey, bigger than Victoria, which has two different hospitals. As a thoracic surgeon, we looked after the interior and the north and the Yukon. So actually, we had, we said we looked after an area geographically the size of France. So a million it served a million population. Wow! But those people came here for thoracic surgery. So little Kelowna, it has a fantastic medical community. But we need to we need to make sure it's supported. Yeah, and even like down to the GP level where we have Absolutely. GPs out there. Like I, I know that it becomes, I guess, not as I, I've talked to a few GPs and they say it's it's not very. Uh, rewarding to work just in, in, in a GP. They're better off working in the hospital than, than they are running at like a medical clinic, the way that the pay structure is set up. So again, I've been at this for 41 years and I've seen the way that the family doctor has been disadvantaged. And I think the tide is turning, but we really need to, we all understand that to have a good healthcare system, you need access to primary care. You need that family doctor and all of the supporting structures. So uh, I believe it's improving, but there's a lot of more work to be done. One of the things uh, federally that Pierre Polly has been talking about is kind of a red seal program for doctors and nurses that come from abroad to, to fast track them into the system. Um, how, how do you think that'll help? Because we do have a lot of qualified people, according to Pierre Polly, that just aren't, they're driving cabs and doing different things. So... It has to be balanced, Jim. Um, you know when you're on holidays in Medicine Hat in the middle of the night and your five-year-old needs their appendix out, you know if that surgeon is certified that 
you're pretty comfortable. So we have tremendously excellent certification levels. However, at the same time, we need to bring the workforce in. A lot of times these are Canadians who went away to train and can't get back in. And so we can't make it a bridge. We need to say, if you're interested in working in healthcare at any level, we assess where you're at and we get you to that next level. You should not be driving cabs. If you want to work in healthcare, we get you to that level. So we need to be more open. Even provincially, like, you know, like, you know, like my Absolutely. daughter's a nurse. She has to get certified both in BC and Alberta instead of like one certification that works across, right? So we've got 10 provinces and three territories and you get, have to get certified at all those different things. All of our drug pharmacies have, have different designations. So it's all the bureaucracy I'm talking about. There's tremendous opportunities for us to get rid of significant bureaucracy across and if the I, country. And if I look at my own profession, I was a, a CMA, and then they finally said, like, either you guys got to merge because we were, there were CPAs, CMAs, or CAs, CMAs, CGAs. and CGAs, yeah. right? And yeah. the C, and the, uh, this goes way back, but the CAs and the, and the CGAs didn't want to play together because they were kind of fighting over each other's works. But I think the government said, like, you're all getting together or none of you are getting together, right? So mm-hmm. there probably needs to be something, like, because doctors and nurses across Canada, yeah. they, they should be certified across Canada. Absolutely. And what we need to do, again, is, yes, you need some leadership from above, but really it needs to be, we need to go to the nurses and say, okay, work with our nursing groups. How, how are we going to do this? And we need to have portability across the country. Yeah. And so it's totally doable. Because if you look at all the administration, there's a College of Physicians and Surgeons for BC. There's one for Alberta. And there's all these administrative, like that could all, especially with AI, you could streamline all of that stuff and and have less administration and more money to put into patient care. Absolutely. And if the principles are you want to make sure the certification is okay, fine. You want to make sure it's safe, fine. All of this can be done and it shouldn't be a barrier to getting care. Yeah, because you would, I mean, I think most Canadians recognize if if you have an accident in, in British Columbia or Alberta, you're going to get a you know a level of care that is very sure. similar. Yep. Right? It's not like it's going to be like, oh, the, the doctors in Alberta and, and our nurses are no good that you got to go to BC, get me across the border yep. here so I can get better care. And, you know, I think BC has an opportunity to provide leadership on some of these things. Yep. Let's get, let's, let's get together. So you get elected. What's your main push? Like what, what's kind of like your first four years? What are you going to want to get accomplished? So I get elected. There's going to be several other United, yeah, ex-United, and, yeah. independents, and we are not affiliated or allied together, but we have a shared origin story. We've been through this together. We come from a center position. We would figure out where we sit, and then we would, on a case-by-case assessment from what each of the governments, is, each side is doing, whether there's a majority or not, and we would decide how we were going to act. So when you speak a center, would explain the center to me what so people understand is that financially? Uh, I would say I'm fiscally conservative. I want to pay my bills. I don't want to leave a debt legacy for my children and my grandchildren. But I'm socially open and compassionate. You know, when I was a doctor for 28 years as a surgeon, we looked after everyone. And I don't want government involved any more than they have to be in our decisions. But I want to be compassionate. Do you not think, like, and I, we see this in, in a few of our organizations where they seem to have been silenced, like, uh, you know, like the, the College of Physicians and Surgeons seems to have silenced doctors and nurses or the nurses union. And then even if we look at the RCMP, like, they're not allowed to speak. We have, what, 14, 14 people in the PR department here at Interior Health, and they all really only ever want, never want to answer a question. All they want to do is put out a press release. Why do we have so many people in communications if they don't want to communicate? And all the communications comes from Adrian Dix or Bonnie Henry. It comes, and you ask really good and insightful questions. And it comes from a top-down structure. And I've always believed that the patient and the person is who we serve for. And, you know, if it's about transparency, it's about telling people what's happening. So I believe that... These organizations are there. They exist not on their own. They exist to serve us. So they need to be transparent. And again, as a surgeon, um, I've never stopped advocating for the patient and always worked on behalf of the patient. And if it was the system or the patient, I would work for the patient. And if it's now, now it'll be the electorate. 
And in, so it's in an, in, in an interesting way, the independent option gives Kelowna voice. One of the, the things that's really surprising to me um, in this election is Andrew Weaver, who was the leader of the BC Greens, who wrote a, a climate change paper that won a Nobel Prize, is actually coming out in sort of support of uh, John Rustad as opposed to David E. He trusts John Rustad with the climate more so than he trusts David Eby. Does that mean like a lot of David Eby's platforms, maybe a lot of talk, but not a lot of uh, walk? So I can't speak for Andrew Weaver, but I do know that significant number of the NDP policies have been very hard in this province. And I don't think we need them. I know that we don't need another four years of them. Five minutes left, and this is your five minutes. Um, you can speak to the, the people of Kelowna, Central Okanagan, and of course, Kelowna Center. Yeah. And uh, let them know what they can expect from you. Thank you, Jim, for the opportunity to talk. Um, this is a historic election because the center doesn't have a true voice. And we know that the center is a significant component of the electorate in Kelowna and throughout the province. So as voters in the new Kelowna Center riding, you have to look how you want to give your vote. And as I mentioned to Jim, I left my career as a thoracic surgeon specifically because I wanted to attend to healthcare. Healthcare can be improved and it desperately has to be improved. And I have a track record of improvements on behalf of the patient and I want to continue to do that. As we've gone to doors for the last six months, more than 5,000 doors we've knocked on, people have told us that they're affected by healthcare, affordability, public safety, and that we really need to go in a better direction. I think we thought a month ago that there was going to be a center-right coalition formed, and we all thought everything would be fine. Despite efforts from all of the BC United candidates, um, those calls were never answered. And in a cynical way, we were going to be left with a significant left or a significant right and no center vote. vote. So it's actually really democratic what we're doing. We're standing up and we will answer not to party and ideology, but we'll answer to the electorate. So I'm, I believe I'm extremely well positioned to be the independent candidate and hopefully the MLA for Kelowna Centre. And following that, we'll continue to listen to what you have to say because my whole career has been about listening and then acting as a surgeon. And I'll continue to do that for you. And hopefully you give me your support on October 19th. One of the big things that, uh, from Kelowna now is that you exercise that vote. Uh, you get out there and vote and, and get to know the candidates. That's why we do these 30-minute interviews so that you can actually get to know uh, the candidate a lot more than just, you know, in a couple-minute hit piece or something like that. Um, understand, the, you know, where they're coming from, what their background is, and, and what they'll do to represent your voice in, in Victoria. Um, if you have young people in your family, uh, encourage them to vote the first time, but encourage them to learn the candidates as well, not just the party stuff. Try to avoid the rhetoric. Try to avoid, like, because this is your chance. What's in it for mm -hmm. me, right? Because mm -hmm. really, the power is with the people. What's in it for the voter? What's in it for British Columbians? It shouldn't be about pushing through rhetoric and, and you know, like one side beating up the other side with just rhetoric. Right? Mm -hmm. Thanks very much for your yeah. time. And we thank you for watching Kelowna Now.